If we could prove beyond doubt that our continued posit of an ancient, once highly advanced yet pre-Ice Age civilization once existing here on our planet, we would literally have to rewrite our understandings of antiquity. We have covered numerous sites, found submerged all around the world. Yet, unfortunately, due to their proximity to islands and the continental regions they are found amongst, many are dismissed as merely being 5 to 10,000 year old ruins, fitting with modern paradigm and, alas, avoiding controversy or the questions which inevitably follow. Yet, our next side of interest may turn out to not only be that most important of submerged ruins ever found on Earth but the smoking gun previously mentioned. On the 19th of May 2001, India's Union Minister for the Science and Technology Division, Murli Manohar Joshi, announced that the ruins of an ancient civilization had been discovered off the coast of Gujarat, in the Gulf of Kambahat. The site was discovered by INOT, National Institute for Ocean Technology. Using sonar, the discovered ruin is now being strongly argued as definitively pre-Ice Age, yet also advanced in nature. NIOT went on to describe an area of regularly spaced artificial structures. Located 20 kilometers from the Gujarat coast and spans 9 kilometers, Joshi claims the site as an urban settlement that predates the Indus Valley Civilization. Further descriptions of the site by Joshi describe it as containing regularly spaced dwellings, a granary, a bath, a citadel, and a drainage system. According to Wiki, quote, the structures and artifacts discovered by NIOT are the subject of contention. The major disputes surrounding the Gulf of Combat cultural complex are claims about the existence of submerged city-like structures, the difficulty associating dated artifacts with the site itself, and disputes about whether stone artifacts recovered at the site are actually geofacts or artifacts. One major complaint is that artifacts at the site were recovered by dredging instead of being recovered during a controlled archaeological excavation." End quote. Simply put, due to the fact that it has not been excavated properly, and we predict probably never will, academia are dismissing this ancient city as simply unconfirmed. We feel a quite ridiculous position to take despite NIOT's supporting data of its existence due to its accidental discovery, presumably via dredging. We find the marine archaeology in the Gulf of Kambat highly compelling. There are countless submerged and very ancient cities dotted across the oceans of our Earth. Many of these cities all but forgotten until their rediscoveries within the modern era. When attempting to locate these mysterious places, it is beneficial for one to be aware of past sea levels. This, of course, can make the task of locating these submerged cities an awful lot easier. The main consensus is that world sea levels have largely stayed the same since the arrival of Homo sapiens, only really dipping or rising by around 120 meters across the Earth. When discussing these finds, you will, on all but a few exceptions, find yourself within these specific regions. One of the more interesting exceptions to this rule has to be the underwater city which was discovered just off the coast of Cuba a few years ago, a submerged city, which sits over 700 meters below the waves. This depth, of course, being far below that which has experienced a breach over the past hundred or so thousand years. 
a theory that the landmass once rested upon the surface, subsequently being sunk by tectonic activities, was argued. Yet since its exploration as a possibility, it has been found to have not been the case. The results of this investigation strongly indicating that this city and its accompanying landmass somehow remained under the waves for more than 100,000 years. Greenville Draper of Florida's International University concluded that it was highly unlikely that such a tectonic event could have occurred, quoted as saying, Nothing of this magnitude has been reported ever before, especially from the Mediterranean. Draper's, among many others' analysis, has of course come to conclusions. Conclusions which thankfully appear honest, making them extremely controversial, yet as with other fields of study in life, they are reluctant to reveal the implications of such conclusions. For example, if the research is correct, and judging by the extremely capable people tasked with this undertaking, there is no reason to suspect it is not, then this submerged city has remained submerged for over a hundred thousand years. This gives us two possible alternatives. One, that the city predates the arrival of developed man on Earth, according to academically accepted timelines. Or two, it reinforces our ever-growing accusations here at Mystery History of a past here on Earth which is unimaginably more ancient than we have been led to believe a human society which has flourished and regressed on no less than three occasions. It could, of course, be both. There is a possibility that this ancient city was indeed built submerged under the waves by a once highly advanced civilization of Homo sapiens. Yet a more likely scenario, of course, would be that this ancient city was constructed at a time when the Caribbean Sea was a dry basin, and as the sea began to form, it was subsequently submerged. Yet, alas, modern academia readily rejects such a hypothesis. So, if we do not accept this as a likely possibility, then we must conclude that a primitive ancient culture, with primitive stone tools, and certainly no diving equipment, were somehow responsible for the construction of this submerged city, complete with enormous pyramids, on a foundation resting over 700 meters beneath the Caribbean Sea. Hey guys! In 1998, a circle of timber posts within the intertidal zone on the North Norfolk coast was brought to the attention of the Norfolk County Council Archaeological Service. A subsequent program of archaeological recording and dating revealed that the structure was constructed in the spring or early summer of 2049 BC, during the Early Bronze Age. Because of the perceived threat of damage and erosion from the sea, a rescue excavation was undertaken during the summer months of 1999. The structure was entirely excavated, involving the removal of the timbers and a program of stratigraphic recording and environmental analysis. A survey was also undertaken within the environs of the site, which has identified further timber structures dating from the Bronze Age. Detailed examination of the timber from the circle has produced a wealth of unexpected information, which has greatly added to our understanding of early Bronze Age woodworking, organization of labor, and the layout and construction of timber ritual monuments. The purpose of Seahenge will undoubtedly be added to the heated debate surrounding that of Stonehenge. The strongest argument so far for such henges has been that of celebratory pilgrimage sites during solstices. Although they remain a mystery, the excavation report was published in 2004 in the National Journal of Proceedings of the Prehistoric Society. A more popular, heavily illustrated account will be published by English Heritage this year. The Holm Tilmer Circle, aka Seahenge, is currently undergoing conservation treatment at the Mary Rose Center in Portsmouth. When this work is completed, the treated timbers will be displayed in the refurbished Lynn Museum in King's Linen, the UK. As always, thanks for watching, guys. Take care. The Sea of Galilee. Although not a real sea, it has remained named as such due to the staunch traditions, mainly religious, which have grown and flourished from around its shores. The first century historian, Flavius Josephus, for example, was so impressed by the areas surrounding the Sea of Galilee, he once wrote, quote, One may call this place the ambition of nature. Reporting a thriving fishing industry around the lake, with well over 200 boats regularly working the waters, archaeologists have since discovered only one such fishing vessel, found in 1986. It has been nicknamed the Jesus Boat. According to Christian religion, 
Much of the ministry of Jesus Christ himself actually occurred upon the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and a recent discovery within the waters themselves has continued to perplex specialists within the area, astounding all who have been exploring said discovery, and weighs an estimated 60,000 tons according to researchers. An astonishing size, making it much heavier than any of our modern-day warships. Rising nearly 32 feet out of the ancient sea's sediment, it also has a diameter of about 230 feet. Stonehenge, for example, which is an impressive ancient structure in its own right, has an outer stone circle diameter of only half that. First discovered in 2003 using sonar exploration of the southwest portion of the sea, Divers have since been down to investigate the presumably ancient structure, writing regarding their finds within the latest issue of International Journal of Nautical Archaeology. Researcher Yitzhak Paz, Antiquities Authority, and Ben Gurion University believes it could date back more than 4,000 years. Quote, the more logical possibility is that it belongs to the 3rd millennium BC, because there are other megalithic phenomena from that time that are found close by. Paz told LiveScience.com in an interview, noting that those sites are associated with fortified settlements. Could it be that this is where the peoples of bet Yura buried and honored their dead? Is this a proverbial city of the dead, or something else entirely? As more research is undertaken, it is only a matter of time before we understand this amazing structure for what it truly once was. We will of course keep you posted. Thanks for watching guys, and until next time, take care. There are many unexplained ruins which can be found within Egypt. Who built the Great Pyramids? What was the true identity and purpose for the Great Sphinx? Countless mysteries still swirl around these enormous structures, and no matter how much academic study is pursued within this mystical place, an answer for how, and indeed why these monstrous feats were undertaken, remains unanswered. The reason for this gap in our understanding, we have come to hypothesize, is due to a paradigm of understanding, the result of which being that we as a species can only recollect a fraction of our history. A case of global amnesia has beset our kind, and unless those with the ability to see through the fog of established and as such heavily researched areas of our history we may never solve the most important question of all. Where do we come from? The reason for our growing, staunch belief in a lost history is only further compounded by the subjects we research, and indeed the seemingly impossible and as yet unanswered methods that an ancient, clearly once highly capable civilization utilized to achieve such remarkable feats of ancient engineering and our next item of choice is of no exception. As mentioned, there exists a heavily researched and indeed unraveled history, which can be archaeologically found amongst these truly impressive ruins. However, although we are led to believe that academia has a handle on the ancient lives of those who dwelled within these structures, there are many areas which tell a different story, and one must question why. Why is there such gaps of explanation, when we are told that much of what these groups undertook has been researched and understood since the time of Edward Carter? Why was the Valley of the Kings lost? Who, and indeed how, were the ancient pyramids constructed? Many of the things we are now under the presumption have been fully explored are merely rediscoveries completely absent from the ream of writing and hieroglyphics later deciphered and read. The submerged city of Heraculon, for example. An entire ancient city, which not only clearly dates from the time of the pyramids, but was also submerged in an event we are yet to be informed of. The rediscovery of this site in recent times is yet another example that the attitudes of those who are granted access to such sites is misplaced, and what we thought we knew about the true creators of said sites is a red herring, a smokescreen, placed down by later, surviving, and due to these unknown events, proven by heavy research, far less capable, far more primitive a civilization, who merely re-inhabited such sites, allowing them to develop to a point where they were not only able to leave their own archaeological legacy amongst these ruins,
but also to claim such intimidating works as their own. Such a reality, such a claimed illusion, would also have made them a perceived force to be reckoned with, an opportunistic strategy that any critical thinking leader would have leapt at to not only preserve one's power, but to ensure the ongoing existence of their own kind. This posited scenario would also explain why the ancient city of Heraculon, and indeed the Sphinx, the Great Pyramids, the Colossus of Memnon, the unfinished obelisk, and so forth, remained undescribed within what is claimed as the builder's writings, and why such incredible feats were seemingly silently undertaken. Any explanation as to how these sites were built, such as that of Baalbek over a thousand miles away, possessed Aswan granite columns many tons in weight, remains a mystery. For one can claim such works as their own, but an explanation as to how they achieved them would not be something they could provide. Who built the ancient city of Heraculon, indeed the entire plateau of Giza? Why is the city submerged underwater? And what happened to those who constructed such sites? It is a pursuit for answers which we find highly compelling. There are countless submerged and very ancient cities dotted across the oceans of our Earth, many of these cities all but forgotten until their rediscoveries within the modern era. When attempting to locate these mysterious places, it is beneficial for one to be aware of past sea levels. This, of course, can make the task of locating these submerged cities an awful lot easier. The main consensus is that world sea levels have largely stayed the same since the arrival of Homo sapiens, only really dipping or rising by around 120 meters across the Earth. When discussing these finds, you will, on all but a few exceptions, find yourself within these specific regions. One of the more interesting exceptions to this rule has to be the underwater city which was discovered just off the coast of Cuba a few years ago, a submerged city which sits over 700 meters below the waves. This depth, of course, being far below that which has experienced a breach over the past hundred or so thousand years. A theory that the landmass once rested upon the surface, subsequently being sunk by tectonic activities, was argued. Yet since its exploration as a possibility, it has been found to have not been the case. The results of this investigation strongly indicating that this city and its accompanying landmass somehow remained under the waves for more than a hundred thousand years. Greenville Draper of Florida's International University concluded that it was highly unlikely that such a tectonic event could have occurred, quoted as saying, nothing of this magnitude has been reported ever before, especially from the Mediterranean. Draper's, among many others' analysis, has of course come to conclusions conclusions which thankfully appear honest, making them extremely controversial, yet as with other fields of study in life, they are reluctant to reveal the implications of such conclusions. For example, if the research is correct, and judging by the extremely capable people tasked with this undertaking, there is no reason to suspect it is not, then this submerged city has remained submerged for over a hundred thousand years. This gives us two possible alternatives. One that the city predates the arrival of developed man on Earth, according to academically accepted timelines, or two, it reinforces our ever-growing accusations here at Mystery History of a past here on Earth which is unimaginably more ancient than we have been led to believe, a human society which has flourished and regressed on no less than three occasions. It could, of course, be both. There is a possibility that this ancient city was indeed built submerged under the waves by a once highly advanced civilization of Homo sapiens. Yet a more likely scenario, of course, would be that this ancient city was constructed at a time when the Caribbean Sea was a dry basin, and as the sea began to form, it was subsequently submerged. Yet, alas, modern academia readily rejects such a hypothesis. So, if we do not accept this as a likely possibility, then we must conclude that a primitive ancient culture, with primitive stone tools, and certainly no diving equipment, were somehow responsible for the construction of this submerged city, complete with enormous pyramids, 
on a foundation resting over 700 meters beneath the Caribbean Sea. The University of Seville, working in collaboration with the Andalusian Institute of Historical Heritage, has conducted an intensive LIDAR survey in a historically compelling area between the Spanish coastal towns of Capasoto and Sancti Petri. Their goal was to discover the remnants of a long-written-of temple, one dedicated to ancient deities. However, what they discovered instead was an incredibly ancient, once enormous, mass dwelling, complex yet intelligently laid out as if almost akin to modern-day standards of care in regard to sanitation management, food production, and quality of dwelling for its massive population's well-being. A mega-metropolis that, predictably, the academics responsible for its discovery have not only attempted to downplay the find, but also tried to claim it as merely proof of their original temple assertion. Clearly, they are merely backing the tale of events put forth by whomever funded said expedition. From the researchers themselves, quote, The survey area consisted of submerged landscape, seemingly dominated by a series of ancient marshes. Something we feel was most probably intelligently managed farmlands prior to the Great Deluge, which eventually drowned this entire mega-metropolis. Yet I digress. They continued, The study revealed a new ancient coastal landscape, with the presence of moorings, an inland port, and several large, monumental buildings." End quote. By combining data from previous anomalous discoveries, the team created a cross-section of findings, and by a process of elimination, they pinpointed an area in which to scan. Yet, interestingly, after said discoveries of the structures, they quickly and simply delimited the entire area without any further field study or investigation whatsoever. Could this rapid delimitation of the area in regards to the LIDAR scanning possibly be in an attempt to obscure the true enormity of this pre-flood ruin? During their focused investigation, they found rectangular structures some 300 by 150 meters in size. However, these discoveries contradicted their own strictly followed academic accounts of this supposedly legendary temple's whereabouts. This discovery being the mission's objective all along, yet curiously, as mentioned, any further expansion of the LIDAR investigations, academic funding has been stonewalled. Could their reluctance to continue further investigations on a mission which has already clearly cost a lot of funding due to them actually having discovered yet another complexly, intelligently, clearly advanced pre-flood megametropolis? Well, we find said possibilities and the rapid growth of independently owned LiDAR technology incredibly exciting. There are many ways to create a misleading, coercive conspiracy. Yet nearly all good stories, even when mostly fictional, to upstand some level of scrutiny must contain that which is known as the kernel of truth. And these kernels can be found throughout the mountains of ancient stories, belief systems, rituals, and medicines worldwide. Found throughout ancient texts, however, interestingly, there are countless accounts of a great deluge, however, modern curriculums are not about finding the truth within these writings, but a form of conformity. We not only feel that the evidence for a flood worldwide exists, but that the pre-flood civilizations who lived through this event, claimed as secluded, primitive, small settlements, didn't venture far until a much later academically claimed dating. Regardless of this, we are now slowly exposing the truth regarding said events. Modern technologies, such as ground-penetrating radar, are now being utilized more and more. Many of these studies are finding mega-metropolises, often now resting beneath and amongst dense forests, having been revealed via this technology to have been not individual settlements, but one enormous city, some with estimated populations of 10 million people or more facts which are in staunch opposition to modern dating paradigms. Along with ours and many others' personal, in-depth research into the technologies and knowledge of the creators and later re-inhabitants of such sites, have also been proven beyond doubt 
to have once had shared knowledge. Unquestionably made by people who were in global communication, endless examples of tools, masonry techniques, and artifacts are often found to have all been crafted in the same ways, with matching scars found at quarries and upon megaliths worldwide. Yet these quarries, again, bring us back to our original message, that of a shared experience of catastrophe, also one of which being the Great Flood. Maybe these groups worked on huge weather-resistant stones as an attempt to face off against such enormous natural forces. Yet it would seem, although they left their mark on the globe, as our research would suggest were in vain, as they were seemingly wiped out in an instant, with many sites abandoned mid-flow during one of these events. Interestingly, not only would the evidence suggest a sudden disappearance of those responsible for many of the most extraordinary megalithic ruins, there have also been remnants found and documented within mainstream funded study, which is not only indicative of a prior knowledge of this possible swelling of the seas, but an immense effort attempted to build fortresses to protect against such an event, dated as 7,000 years old. From an article titled, quote, This 7,000-year-old wall was the earliest known defense against rising seas. Lizzie Wade states, and I quote, About 7,000 years ago, seas were rising all over the world. Ice Age glaciers were melting, and the ocean crept up shorelines and toward people's homes on every inhabited continent. Now, archaeologists have discovered the earliest known defense against those rising seas a 7,000-year-old seawall built to protect a farming village from worsening storm surges and encroaching saltwater from the Mediterranean Sea. Ultimately, however, the wall failed. It now lies drowned off the coast of Israel, along with the rest of the settlement it was meant to protect." End quote. Additionally, Amy Gusick, an archaeologist at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles, California, who studied this period around California's Channel Islands, stated, and I quote, All the different kinds of responses we see toward sea level rise 7,000, 8,000, 9,000 years ago, we're still seeing all of those same responses today. Discoveries such as these, not only proof of our ancient ancestors' awareness in regards to the possible dangers of rising sea levels, but supports the argument that human contributions are not as catastrophic as are currently believed by some to be. The questions regarding their origins, however, who was once responsible for such remarkable efforts, remains a mystery, one which we are determined to solve. It is a journey of discovery which we find highly compelling.